Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. Uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing and encouragement and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with His Word, and more in love with people. Come on, let's get excited this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. And as you're doing so, you'll notice the title of my message. God is able. Hello? God is able. Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. In the precious word of God. And as you get there, if you'll draw your attention with me to verse number 14 and following. Verse number 14 and following. And Paul, here he's praying... This is his second prayer for this church, for these saints in Ephesus. The first time he prays for one thing here, we're going to see him pray for something else. And so look with me as he begins praying. He says, for this cause, he says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He said that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened, with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice what he finishes with. He says, Now... Unto him, now unto him, he says, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, he says, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, amen. Father, we thank you for the day that you have made, and certainly you are maker of heaven and earth. And so, Lord, we give you the praise right from the get-go. And your name is hallowed. And so, Lord, help us never to forget your greatness and your glory. And God, we thank, we're so thankful for the name of Jesus. We know from your word that there's power in the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus. And Lord, to think about the fact that you are Able, you are more than able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. According to the power that works in us, Lord, that should get a hold. That should arrest our attention this morning. God, I pray that you'll give me the words to speak this morning. And that you'll flow in this place. Your spirit will have free course. And that you, through the preaching and teaching of your word and the wooing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, there might be people in this room, might be people watching online to come to faith in Christ today. Lord, I pray for us as believers that we might be encouraged, that we might be reinvigorated as it were because of the fact and the promise that you are able. And so, Lord, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight because you are my strength and you are my redeemer. I give you the praise. I give you the glory. I give you the honor in advance of what you will do through this special time of us looking at what's your word and what you have to say to your church today. And I do so in the precious and powerful name of your son, Jesus. And for his sake, all of God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. But I want us, as we begin our message this morning, I want to begin, I really want us to begin by making sure, listen, I don't know, it's time to wake up. I want to make sure that everybody in this place, if you're watching online, I want to make sure that we know, I want to make sure that we understand that God is able. Hey, listen, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Listen, uh, other, uh, aside from lying, watch this, aside from lying, he cannot lie. He's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Aside from lying, my God is able to do anything. 
hold on, about 12 of you got excited. Listen, this ought to be exciting to us. Let me ask the question, who needs God to do something in your life today? Then when I say, when the word of God says that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, somebody, please, somebody, or I might as well just sit down now, somebody ought to get excited. Okay, okay. Now we're, now, that was kind of Travis speaking excitement. I watched online a few weeks ago, y'all people get excited when Travis preaches. Praise the Lord for that, amen. Yeah, you gotta be, yeah, that's right. The fact of the matter is that our God's power, our God's ability has been on display all the way back since the beginning for everyone to see and for everyone to take notice. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. He says, for the invisible things, watch this, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 33 and verse number 6 and following. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Isn't that a, that'll blow your circuit breaker. We just got crazy. People traveled to Cleveland, Ohio, back here on my left, got crazy about a solar eclipse. You know the one who spoke the heavens into existence is our God? Listen. Thomas says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. Oh my goodness, he says, and he layeth up in the depth of storehouses. Let all the earth, verse 8, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Watch it, verse number 9, it's getting crazy. It says, for he spake and it was done. Hold on, he spake and it was done. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. When God says something, that settles it. There's a lot of people in 2024 getting on the jukebox on the TV and everywhere else saying things. That don't make it so. Be careful who you're listening to. When God says something, that settles it. Jeremiah, I think about old Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Here's what Jeremiah said about God's power in Jeremiah 32, 17. He said, Ah, oh, Lord God, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And there is, watch he says, there's what? There's nothing too hard for thee. Oh, the wonder working power and ability of God is on display day after day after day. I was out here yesterday doing a little push mowing and Mark drove by and Mark, something that you said to me arrested my attention. And I said, I said, man, we, I was there, I was a little bit wet and Mark says, hey, hey, I, I could do this, I could do this. I said, no, Mark, go on home. Christina's waiting for you. She's got chores for you to do. No, I just, I said, get on home before you're getting in trouble with the boss. No, and you know what I said? It's a beautiful day out, isn't it? And some of you yesterday, you got to be careful. Listen, that little drizzly rain, sometimes it gets you down. But I said, it's a beautiful day. And Mark arrested my attention. He says, every day when the light comes up, it's a beautiful day. Oh, the power and ability of our God, the wonder-working power is on display. Job, oh, listen, Job went through it, didn't he? Anybody say Job went through it? He went through it. Job, he acknowledged God's ability and power. He said this in Job 42, 2. He said, I know that thou can do anything. And that no thought, that word thought there means purpose. He says, and that no thought or purpose can be withholden from thee. In other words, none of your thoughts, none of your purposes, God. Job says, can, they can't be stopped. They can't be stopped because you're all powerful. Oh, listen. Ironically, it's been said that all Christians believe that God can do anything. But watch the rest of that. All Christians, they believe that God can do anything. But very few actually believe He will. In fact, ironically enough, many still wonder, is God able to save? I got news for you, He's able to save. 
Hey, listen, if you need Jesus today, God's able to save from the uttermost to the guttermost. Listen, he's able to save. He wants to have a relationship with you. In fact, in our uh, tackle box lesson, Travis, and I didn't even give this, but the Son of Man in Luke 19.10, said, Jesus said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Paul, uh, Luke, the writer of Acts, says in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12, he says this, he says, uh, There is none other name given among, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Oh, God is able to save. In Hebrews, I like the writer of Hebrews, he reminds us in verse number 19, he says, The law made nothing perfect. Stop right there for a second. Just soak that in for a second. He says, The law made perfect. What perfect? And yet people were trying to live according to the law. And Jesus, thank God for Jesus. He came to set the captive free. He came to restore sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Listen, this is what he does. And it says, for the law, I'll show that once again. Verse number 19, the law made nothing perfect. But watch this. But the bringing in of a better hope did. Y'all know who that better hope is? Someone say who it is. The better hope is Jesus. Oh, listen. He says, which, which, uh, which by the which we draw nigh unto God. In verse number 22 of Hebrews chapter 7, the Bible says that Jesus was made a surety of a better testament. Are you sure about Jesus today? I got news for you. I'm sure. I'm convinced. I'm headed for heaven and you can't help it. Listen, you can't stop it. This, this train's moving on. This bus is heading out of the station. I'm headed for heaven. And soon and very soon, I'm going to see the king. I'm going to go see him. I'm going to go see him. I often tell my wife, when I go see the king, you better take care of Colonel. <laughs> Chances are, I'm, listen, I'm not a gambling man, but if I look at statistics, the reality is she's probably going to outlive me by a long shot. And so I need you to look after my little buddy. For those who don't know, Colonel is my little two-and-a-half-year-old puppy dog. And we know that all dogs go to heaven, so just keep telling him about Jesus. Darren sent me a picture the other day of his cat and asked me, he asked, he had a cat on his chest and he had the word of God open. He said, do you ever read scripture to your dog? I said, I, I read it to him. I sing songs of the faith to him. I, 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 I try to get him saved all the time I can. A dog just looks at me. I said, do you know Jesus? And he just looks at me. <laughs> you know, isn't God good? Can I tell you something? God is good to give us companions and pets. I'll just be honest with you. I'm going to be real honest with you. That little puppy dog goes with me just about everywhere. The only danger I face is when my wife looks at me. And I start to head out the door, and she said one time, she says, I wonder if you love that dog more than you love me. I got news for you. There's no chance that'll ever happen. If push comes to shove, old Colonel is going to have to check out. The writer of Hebrews goes on. He's talking about Jesus was made a surety of a better testament. In verse 25 of that passage, watch what he says. He tells us that he is also able to save them, as I mentioned a moment ago, to the uttermost that come to God by him. Folks, that word uttermost literally comes from the Greek word pantales, and it means full-ended, that is entire or complete. So in other words, when Jesus saves, and I got news for you, he is able to save. And when Jesus saves, he saves fully and he saves completely. Somebody say amen. amen. The Apostle Paul, he knew all about the salvation of Jesus Christ. He understood all about it there on the Damascus Road. He had that, that interchange with Jesus and it changed his life. And he understood what Jesus' salvation looked like. And 
He wrote a letter to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15. And here's what he said to Timothy. He said, this is a faithful saying. In other words, it's true. He said, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to what? To save sinners like me. Notice what Paul said. He said, he came to save sinners of whom I am chief. He had an estimation of how uh, depraved, how lost, how needy he was. And he said, Jesus came to save sinners. Oh, what a Savior we serve. Oh, listen, somebody ought to get excited. The, the, Paul writes in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I am so thankful that I am a whosoever. I don't need a name. I don't need a title. I got Jesus. We get so caught up in titles and so caught up in what we want and so caught up in what we think we ought to have and should have because of our education, because of our notoriety, because of something else. Listen, the only thing I need is Jesus. Oh, listen. Jesus is not only able to save Jude in Jude 24. The Bible says that he's also able to keep us from falling. Look at what it says. It says, he is able to keep us from falling and to present you, the Bible says, faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, he's able to save. He's able to keep us from falling. Philippians 4.19, Paul teaches us that God is also able to provide all our needs. He says, but my God, he says, my God shall supply all your need according to, watch this, according to his riches. He didn't say that he was going to supply your need uh, from his riches or subtract from his riches or take away from his riches in some way depleting the richness of God. He says, no, he's able to supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Oh, listen, scripture tells us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 8, it says God is able. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Friends, he's able to meet our needs. But let me just say this. Don't just be satisfied with that. We miss out on so many miracles like that song says. Hey, listen, God is more than just a need meter. He's more than just your cosmic bellhop, as my predecessor used to say. He's more than that. Oh, he's more than able. Oh, listen. He is God of very God. And as Travis declared a couple of weeks ago, he is glorious. He is God of very God. He is glorious. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are bound we are bound by and we are bound to His glory. Oh, we read throughout the scriptures that God is also able to deliver us from trials. He's able to deliver from testing. He's able to deliver us from temptations. And to be honest, we could go all throughout this book. And I'll be honest, we could highlight all of the people, quite honestly, in some way or another, some degree, we could highlight the people that we read about and see in scripture who have actually been delivered by God. But when I was putting this message together, my mind immediately, in my heart, immediately drew back to God's deliverance. We talked about it at the men's uh, barbecue a couple weeks ago. My, my mind drew back to God's deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and not only his deliverance of those, those little Hebrew boys, but also of Daniel. You remember the story in Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then in Daniel chapter 6 with Daniel... They all, they all were delivered by God. But watch this. They all exercised confidence in God. Let me ask a question. Somebody going through a test right now? Say, I got a test. If you're high school, I know you got some tests coming up. They're called final exams. You know what a final exam is, Caleb? I see them looking at you, so I'm going to pick on you today. I know that makes you very uncomfortable because you're an introverted young man, but that's okay. I'm going to get you out of your box today. You know what a final exam is all about? It's to find out if you learned what they've been trying to teach you. You know what? One of these days, all of us are going to face a final exam with Jesus. He's going to find out if we learned everything he's trying to teach us along the way. But I think of these stories. 
of deliverance. And Caleb, I believe you will be delivered to the next grade. <laughs> My, you will be delivered on. I have confidence that you will study and you will show yourself worthy of the next point in your life. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. He said, he finds out that they're not willing to bow down to the image. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he gives them a second chance. Uh, somebody say, I'm thankful for second chances. Oh, man. And third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances, right? So Nebuchadnezzar gives them a second chance. He says, listen, guys, if you just bow down, it's okay. It's going to be good. Y'all just bow down at the time you hear the music. When the music plays, I want to know that you bow down. And here's what the Bible tells us in Daniel 3, 16 and 17. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Time out for a second. In other words, we don't need to pray about it. We don't need to seek counsel. We already know what the answer is. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Look what he says in verse 17. If it be so. Now that phrase, if it be so, is literally these three Hebrew boys saying, if you got to throw us into the furnace, then you're just going to have to throw us into the furnace. So watch what it says. It says, if it be so. They go on, they say, our God, our God whom we serve. Do you serve Jesus today? It says, our God whom we serve. Notice what they said. They said, he is able. He is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of, not only is he going to deliver us out of the furnace, he's going to deliver us out of your hand, O king. That's some dangerous words when you're held in captivity. Verse 25 of the passage tells us, by the way, they threw him into the fiery furnace. Verse 25 of that passage tells us that when Nebuchadnezzar, he went to the, to the furnace and he looked into the furnace. He looked in the furnace and he saw a dance party going on. He looked into the furnace and the Bible says, he said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like, hold on a second, the Son of God. Hold on a second. Hold on. This pagan king, this reprobate, this one who does not have a relationship with God, he looks into the furnace and he threw three in, but now he looks in and he says four of them, you know, doing the high step. They're doing the high step across through the fire. And he says, hold on a second. He says, not only were there three, there was four. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. How do you know what the Son of God looks like? Hey, let me just time out. If you're visiting here, I'm sorry I'm so weird. <laughs> Travis said, sorry, we're weird. But I'm not sorry about getting excited about Jesus. I may be goofy. You may walk out of here and say, man, that dude's, that dude's plugged in. That, dude, that dude's got a few loose wires. All right, that's okay. That's okay. Incredible story about Daniel. You got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's the incredible thing about Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, his plight Daniel chapter 6 with old King Darius. You remember King Darius? He's the one who signed the 30-day no prayer decree. And uh, what's incredible about Daniel's story is in Daniel chapter 16, watch what the Bible says. It says, then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and they cast him into the den of lions. So guess what? Daniel showed strength and integrity and old Darius says, guess what? You got to go into the, into the lion's den. Watch what he says. Not only was Daniel convinced about God's ability, oh, King Darius was convinced. Notice it says, Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, what did he say? He will what? He will deliver thee. Oh, no matter what you and I face, no matter what we go through, you and I need to be sure. We need to understand that our God is able to deliver. Oh, and while we're on the subject, 
since I got a lot of people in this room and I got a lot of family members who are going through it right now and I can look around and I can pick them out if I wanted to, could have them stand up. I want you to know that God is able to heal physically. Oh, come on, somebody get excited. God's able to heal physically. And I know some of you just hold, hold, hold on to your knickers. I am not doing a disservice to this passage because we're going to get back to the meaning of this passage. Some of you are like, oh, he's, he's really going off the rails on this passage. No, because we ain't even started to exegete the passage. I'm just making the point that God is able. And he's able to heal physically. The New Testament is chalked full of examples where our Lord healed people physically. In Matthew chapter 9, I read about two blind men. They come to Jesus, and in verse number 28, they come and they're crying out for mercy to Jesus. And in verse number 28 of Matthew 9, Jesus says unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Yes, we believe. And these men believe that Jesus was able to heal them physically. I got a question for you this morning. If you're facing some physical thing that is surmounting, some thorn in the flesh, something else that is going on in your life, do you believe that he is able to heal you physically? Or do we just give him lip service like we believe? You see, there's a difference between lip service and actual faith that God can raise us up and heal us physically. I got news for you. I've been there, done that. And I can write a little mini book about it. There was a time in 2007, for those that don't know anything about my story, there was a time in 2007 when I started getting sick. And it seemed like I was sick all the time. And I was laying one time, I had been studying abroad down in Columbia, South America. I came home. I had to be home for my son's birthday. I got home and, and I, was, I, was, I, I was as white as this speaker. His pale and looked like death warmed over. And I told my wife, I said, I don't feel good. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I started feeling bad a couple of days ago. And the next thing I know, three weeks uh, later, I'm still in the hospital. And the hospital didn't seem much like a hospital to me. In fact, when I looked around, it felt more like a nursing home. And I said, listen, I'm in my 40s. Why am I in a nursing home? And my wife said, guess what? This is where they put you. The reality is, three weeks later and about 35 pounds less, I went through it. Went through it and thought I was dying in that moment. And over the next five years, I'd be in and out of the hospital once and twice and three times a year with colon health and other intestinal health and everything like that. I came to Battlefield Baptist Church as the assistant pastor in uh, July, August of 2012. And it wasn't three months later that I was walking around holding my side Leon, what's going to happen? My wife said, you got to go to the doctor. I said, no, I'm not going to go to the doctor because there's an election coming up. I got to do my chore. I got to vote. And she says, you're crazy. And I said, just watch me. Watch me. And I laid there. And she'll tell you the God's honest truth. When I finally got to the hospital, the doctor came in. He said, I got good news and bad news. He said, the good news is you made it. The bad news is you're too sick for me to do something with. He said, another day or two, you'd have been dead. A few days later, they, they cut a zipper line across my belly, four other incisions here, and did work and took out a large section of my colon. And I got news for you. When I come out of that surgery, I started feeling around because I thought maybe they had put a colostomy on me. I thought, Lord, help me. Lord, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And the first thing, and my wife will tell you, I was literally coming out of it, uh, and, and that was what I started reaching for. Because I was so sick. And my wife said, you don't have one. Praise the Lord. They got it. They believe they got it. And I'll be honest with you. It's been a journey ever since. There's ups and downs and ins and outs with things that I can eat and things that I cannot eat. But I'm here to tell you that God is able to heal physically. I'm proof. And either you believe it or you don't. I think about not only those two blind men... Not only those two blind men, but I think about that impotent man who'd been laying by the pool of Siloam in John chapter 5. This dude had been sick for 38 years. That's more than some of y'all been alive. 38 years he'd been sick. We read about Jesus' interaction with him. In John chapter 5 and verse number 6, watch what the Bible says. It says, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, wilt thou be made whole? Listen, he had a choice. 
He said, wilt thou be made whole? I'm asking you, do you want to be made right? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healed? And the man, notice what he does. Instead of saying, yes, Lord, I want to be made whole. Oh, thank you for showing up. Thank you finally for coming to the pool of Siloam. This is what the man says in verse number 7 and following. The impotent man answered him and said, sir, I have no man. Jesus says, you don't need no man. I'm here. He says, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another stepped down before me. And Jesus said unto him, watch. He almost as if Jesus ignores his excuse. Jesus says, rise, take up thy bed and walk. In verse number 9, the Bible says, and, and how, how soon did he do it? Immediately. Immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. Oh, folks, we could go on and on with story after story and example after example of God's ability to heal physically and otherwise. But the only reason that I've shared all of this, the only reason that I've talked about the fact that God is able to save, God is able to keep us from falling, God is able to uh, provide our needs and, and to deliver us through trials and testings and temptations and, and the fact that God is able to heal, the only reason that I've shared all of this was to remind us and God willing, reinvigorate us to the reality that our God is able. However, there are times, there are times when our God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, in his own sovereignty, chooses to provide, he chooses to deliver, and he chooses to heal in a way that is completely different from what you and I typically want and many times what you and I typically pray for. In fact, we need go no further than the Apostle Paul who tells us in 2 Corinthians 12 that he had prayed on three separate occasions for this thorn in his flesh, for this infirmity that he was dealing with. He had prayed, prayed, and prayed again for God to remove it out of his life. And you know what God's answer was? What was God's answer? He said, no, no. He said, no. And in verse number 9, some of you already started there. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. God is able. We ought to pray and we ought to think and we ought to act and believe that he's able. But there are times in his infinite wisdom, according to his sovereignty, that he says, is a hard saying. But sometimes he says no. But sometimes he says no. Scripture tells us about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in prison in Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 6. And I could make a case, I could make an argument for you. That, that John's release from prison, from Herod, his release at that time would have been for God's glory. Because if you look at John's previous life, he would have continued to go on and preach the gospel. And you would have thought, man, this would have been amazing for God's glory that John would be released from prison. But if you know the rest of the story, you know it wasn't so. In fact, Herod ordered John to be beheaded at the behest of his daughter, who no doubt, who no doubt asked for that for her mom who hated John. Who no doubt went to her dad and her dad says, baby girl, what do you want? Isn't that a sick, twisted birthday wish? What do you want? I want the head of John the Baptist here on a charger. I want it right here. God was able, someone say yes, he was able, he was able to do, he was able to have John released. In fact, you say, how do you know that? Because he did it with Peter. You remember Peter's locked up? And you know what God does? The angel, the shackles fall off of Peter, and guess what? The door basically opens. So he's still able, 
to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. But there are some times when God's children, there are some times when I, sometimes when you, we will be called upon to endure some hardship, suffer physically, financially, emotionally. And yes, there are even times, as we see in Scripture, that we may be called to die. And when this happens in our life in real time, we can be tempted, watch this, we can be tempted by our adversary, the devil who walks about seeking whom he may devour. We can be tempted to believe the lie that God doesn't love us or that God doesn't care for us. God, why did you do this for this person and you didn't do it for my loved one? Well, why did you do it for him or her and you didn't do it for me? Why did you do it for pastor? I mean, how, why didn't you just let him die? I have no clue. He has a plan and a purpose for all of us. But friends, we cannot fall for the lies of our adversary. Because scripture not only speaks of God's love, it highlights how he proved his love to us through his son Jesus Christ. Truthfully, you and I will never be able, just be honest, we'll never be able to comprehend in totality all that God does and the interaction, watch this, the interaction between our prayers and his will. Don't you think there were people praying for John the Baptist's release? Oh yeah, there were people praying. Don't you think there were people praying for others to be uh, healed and released? and all that? Yes, all through time, all through uh, the history of the world we've seen this. But the reality is it's okay. I don't have to comprehend it all. Now look back with me in Ephesians chapter 3. Because it's important for us to know this second prayer that Paul prays. Right, The first prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, you can read that in verses 15 through 23. In his first prayer, Paul is praying for enlightenment. He's praying that the eyes of their understanding, that these, these believers, might, their eyes might be open to the reality of God's power. Right, But now here in chapter 3, he's praying and his focus is on God's enablement. God's enablement in their life. And so, but the thing is, he's not praying uh, for God to do something physically or materially. He's praying for a greater need. He's praying for them spiritually. Now watch what he says. Let's read our passage again in verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you... According to, there it is again, not out of his riches, right? Not subtracting from his riches, not taking away from his riches, but that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know. He says, I want you to know, he's praying for them to know the love of Christ, which passes under all knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he finishes up with this kind of doxology, right? He says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, watch, unto him again be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And so let's wrap it up really quickly. A couple of things here. Notice in verse number 16, Paul prays for them, number one, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You see, the presence of the Holy Spirit is evidence of new life in Christ. But the power of the Holy Spirit in our life is what enables you and me, no matter what we face, to live for Jesus Christ. Secondly, look at verse 17. Paul prays for them that Christ may dwell in their hearts by faith. That word dwell comes from the Greek word meaning to house permanently or to reside. Therefore, what Paul is saying, he's asking God to, to deepen their relationship, their relationship with Christ, that it might be deepened, right? Uh, we see a similar uh, theme in Colossians 3.16 where Paul, he's writing to the church at Colossus. He says, let the word of Christ 
dwell in you richly in all wisdom. When he says in Colossians 3.16 to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, what he's saying is let the word of Christ be at home in your life. Let me ask a question. Is the word of God at home in your heart and in your life? You see, it, if we're going to face the difficulties that come along with life, we're going to need the Word of God dwelling richly in our hearts. It's going to need to take up residency in our hearts and be at home. And we talked about having the mind of Christ last week. John, uh, Jesus puts it this way in John 15. He says in verse number 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, he says, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he says, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Paul continues, let's keep it going. He continues his second prayer request in verse 17 by reminding the saints that in Christ they are rooted and grounded in what? Love. Rooted and grounded in love. Isn't that what Jesus said? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. He said, I give you a new commandment, a new commandment, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, right? He tells them that in John 13, 34 and 35. He says, and by that, he says, by this, this identity, everybody's going to know that you're connected with me. And so uh, the reality is, since life happens, Paul is reminding them and reminding you and I today that only a deep and a stable relationship with Jesus will sustain us. I got news for you. I don't know how people do it without Jesus. When sickness comes... When testings and trials and temptations come, when, when you, you're, you're facing it financially, you're trying to figure out how you, you, have, uh, uh, you, know, you have basically nothing of nothing and you're trying to figure out how am I going to pay the bills, how am I going to eat, how am I going to do this and that and all the other. Oh, listen, I don't know how people get around without Jesus. Oh, listen. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Listen, Matthew chapter 7, and you can read all about it for yourself, but in verses 24 through like 29, you can read about the trouble that you and I will face when we build our lives and our homes on anything other than the rock of Jesus Christ. Right? Listen, you, you want to build on sand, you go ahead. You want to go down to the beach and build your house on a sand? You go ahead. Wait for the winds and the waves to come in. No. Jesus said you got to build your house on the rock. Listen, we have to be careful of what we're building our families on. Mom, Dad, Grandpa and Grandma, you've not been released from your responsibility either. They'll always be your kids. They'll always be your grandkids. Tell them about Jesus. Oh, friends, we've got to do this. And so Paul, he's praying that they would know this. Look at me. Verse 18 and 19, he keeps praying. He says that they would be able to comprehend, right? He's wanting them to comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and to be filled with all the fullness of God. That word comprehend in verse number 18 comes from two Greek words. They're combined here. Two Greek words meaning, watch this, to take eagerly, to seize, to possess, or to apprehend. Typically, when we talk about the word comprehend, we're saying to ourselves that we have some type of ability mentally to understand something. That's not what Paul is saying here. When he says that they would be able to comprehend, watch it here in verse number 18, that they would be able to comprehend with all the saints all of the things that he's talking about God, right? He, what he's saying is that, that we would be able to take, that we would be able to possess something for ourselves now what is he saying that he wants us to possess well he tells us in verse number 19 look he wants us to possess or to know or to seize and apprehend the knowledge he wants us to know the love of Christ look at verse 19 the love of Christ which passes knowledge well listen Jesus Christ's love for his church is unmatched 
It's unparalleled, and you and I will never, ever be able to fully comprehend his love. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can be filled with his love. We can be filled with his light and his wisdom and his holiness and his power. And yes, just like a superhero, unzip it, and people will see the glory of God radiating inside of you. So in review, God is able. Hold on, a few of you got, got lazy on me. God is able. But what was Paul saying? In review, he wanted their inner man to be strengthened. Why? He wanted our inner man, our inner being to be